Good afternoon, Ms. Lata. Good afternoon. Mm. Thank you very much for doing this interview with us. Good for you. Uh, we, we already know that you were the Prime Minister of Italy in 2000, uh, 2013 to 2014, and then you uh, you went to the uh, science hub and uh, to be a teacher and to be in the dean there. I uh, would like to know that, uh, how do you feel about teaching there, and could you uh, introduce for our audience a little bit about the science hub? Uh, Sciences Po is one of the most uh, uh, known and most reputed universities on many fields. First of all, on uh, international affairs in the world. It's based in Paris, but we have uh, a very wide, worldwide uh, openness because we teach in English many courses. Uh, it is possible to come to Sciences Po from uh, many corners of the world. Uh, we have just 30% our students that are uh, French from origin. The other 70% uh, in our School of International Affairs are coming from China to uh, America to Germany, Italy uh, and uh, many other countries. Um, I am very happy uh, because of, of, of my decision to join Sciences Po. Uh, first of all because Sciences Po, because Paris and because this very world uh, class worldwide uh, uh, school uh, of international affairs. Then, because teaching today and uh, working with students, and young students, I think it's, it is one of the most interesting, exciting experiences, experiences because we, we, we are living in a world in which changes and uh, crises are a continuous sequence without uh, interruption. Normality is not more the rule. This is why uh, it's, it's very refreshing for me to work with students and to have their uh, inputs, their ideas, but also to share with them some ideas on how to uh, run international affairs today, international relations, international organizations. Uh, and so it's, it's not only teaching, it's also working with them, organizing events with them. And also, of course, the reason why I'm today in Beijing, the fact that we have a very large set of relationship at the global level with the best universities, and uh, this is why here with, with Beijing University is one of the most successful uh, relationships we have. Uh, good students, good professors, good environment, uh, and it is the part maybe of my new job that I love the most because it's, uh, it's really fantastic to see the world on another perspective, from the perspective of universities, students, uh, students and uh, uh, the environment, research environment, uh, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. And you, you've mentioned that uh, the students there are world, from worldwide. And do you think they, they have any difference with uh, European students or Italian students? Of course, it depends on the fields. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk about uh, the European Union and Europe, my courses, my lessons are on Europe, my teaching is on Europe, it is clear that there is there's a big difference. The big difference is not uh, before Chinese and the others, it's before Europeans and the others. The Chinese uh, have the same approach uh, than the Americans or, uh, I don't know, the Indonesians or the Brazilians. So it's an approach different from Europeans. The Europeans, they know Europe, they know all the jargon uh, of the uh, Euro bureaucrats. They know everything about uh, Europe and so it's easier for them, but at the same time, it's a way to be uh, in, uh, in the European uh, field, in the European facts, without uh, any surprise. Being there, but knowing everything. Uh, for, the, for the other students, it's very interesting for me, as teacher, to work with them on Europe. Because I know that uh, I, 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 it's a big mistake with them to give something for granted. And we, the Europeans, the main problem we, uh, we do on European affairs is to give for granted. And now we are um, seeing, uh, uh, checking in, uh, in many fields, in many European countries, 
take Brexit. Mm -hmm. That uh, we don't need, we don't have to be for granted anything mm -hmm. on Europe. This is why for me it's very interesting to teach Europe and to work on Europe with Chinese students or American mm -hmm. students, not only with European uh, one. Uh, it's, a, it's a great lesson for me. Okay. Actually, well, we've already witnessed a lot of changes in Europe and in these years and uh, the crisis uh, that the European Union have met. And uh, I actually, I think I've read one of your interviews with the political, I, th I think, I took earlier this year, and you said that uh, uh, immigration now is a crucial problem for, for the Europe in the years to come. And uh, you want to train uh, Europe's younger generations to grasp all the dimensions of this problem. So I would like to know that uh, what do you exactly mean by saying all dimensions of a problem? And which of which one of them is the most important one to teach to teach, teach, teach them teach the younger generations? Uh, there's first of all a general uh, approach. My generation was used to work uh, at university at school with teachers uh, telling us about normality and saying that. Uh, between normalities, there can be a crisis. Today, the world is completely different. The world and the way in which we run international affairs or even domestic affairs at political level, it is a sequence of crises. No more normalities. Sequence of crises. So you have to work with students and you have to teach and to help students to feel, no, feel crisis as normality. <laughs> that is strange to say, but it's true. Uh, look at, at the European situation today. We had the financial crisis, then we get out from the financial crisis, and immediately after, the migrant crisis, the refugee crisis. We are in the middle of the uh, refugee crisis, and tuck, Brexit, another one. At the same time, terrorist attacks in Paris or in uh, uh, Germany or in Brussels. So we have to know that the world of today and the world of tomorrow is a world in which we have to share with our neighbors, with our citizens, uh, that we have to live in a sequence of crises. So we have to, uh, uh, to learn to be more flexible, to adapt ourselves to the changes in the uh, word. This is why uh, at Sciences Po in Paris we work very much on simulations. Not only the typical lesson, frontal lesson, but sim many simulations. Why? Because in the simulation you can change the facts of the simulation in the work in progress and so you can oblige yourself and the students to adapt themselves to the new situation and to understand how uh, can we uh, work on flexible uh, situations. And uh, migration is one of these issues. We, we weren't used in, 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 in Europe to, to work with millions of people arriving. It was always uh, small figures. Now, uh, after Iraq, Afghanistan and Syria, three wars, and after the Libyan crisis, now we are experiencing in the last uh, two years one million people arriving. And one, people, uh, one million people arriving means that you have to work on a set of policies to understand how uh, to select them, how to uh, organize their arrival, and how to reorganize our public services in our countries and also how to deal with the fear of our citizens. Because our citizens, they fear the arrival of many foreigners with different religions, different uh, ethnic origins. It's a complex uh, work, but it's a very, this is why I said, it's a large set of policies. And we weren't used to, to work with these uh, policies. This is why we have to work with them, knowing that there are also differences within the European Union. You know, the founders' countries of the European Union, like uh, France or uh, 
uh, Italy or Germany are countries with many immigrants. We are used to work with immigrants, but the newcomers of the European Union, uh, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, the Baltic countries, are countries without immigrants. They are not used to, to know what it, it is, an immigrant. So it is very important to work and so to share all these differences. It's, uh, it's not easy. Yeah, well, I think you've already brought up many issues I want to ask <laughs> as following for your questions. Since you mentioned the, 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 the well, tens of thousands of people that migrated to Europe and the fears within Europe, and also the third of that many, as I understand, is that the, it's a, it's a, it would be a large set of the policies and, uh, and not single country or, or single policies could solve all those problems. So now it seems that uh, the Europe now seems to be facing a deadlock. I think upon, upon this issue, and some countries refuse to cope with it on the EU level uh, solution. You mentioned Hungary and Poland. And uh, even, I think, uh, the, the Italian government uh, just recently said that uh, if, well, there's not be uh, some other update uh, when they, they will refuse to, to, to accept the new deal that the European Commission uh, brought up. So, uh, I think it, 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 does this mean that uh, a more in, in, in integrated Europe becomes harder to achieve because of these refugee crisis? Do you think well, the Europe now has the cap capability to, to really solve this problem? The refugee crisis is affecting uh, the European uh, homogeneity, the European integration is very clear. You're right, and it's a very big challenge. But it is a challenge because we never had such a, a refugee crisis like the one we are uh, Experiencing now, we had just something of similar during the Berlin Wall fall. It, we were uh, around the 90s, but it was not similar. It was less uh, less difficult uh, to absorb because they were all uh, white and uh, Christians from origin. Now we are experiencing a very complicated issue that is linked to the homogeneity in terms of ethnical origins and religious differences. Uh, this is why it is complicated. Uh, this is why uh, we, we need first of all to tell to our people the true story. And the true story is that uh, the three main origin countries of these one million of refugees we are having today in Europe are the three countries Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Three wars that we had in the last 15 years in which the Western countries were protagonists. And the Western countries made a lot of mistakes. Take Iraq or take Afghanistan, even Syria. This is why I think on these issues we have first of all to understand that this refugee crisis is the outcome many mistakes that the Western countries did. Uh, and if you say that, you change perspective. You change the way in which you, you look at this topic. Second, we have to understand that, uh, uh, of course, we have to solve the problem there. So first uh, mission is to solve the Syrian crisis and to arrive there to a solution to get possible for these people to uh, be back at home, because they want to go back. Uh, the third a great, great, great uh, uh, problem is the fact that uh, absorbing one million people in a continent of 500 million people is not impossible. It's one out of 500, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's possible. The key point is that it is possible if you spread uh, and if you find a diffused solution. This is why I think Europe has to be very tough with countries like Poland and Hungary. It is unacceptable that there are countries, big countries, Poland is a big country, Hungary is an important country, refusing to accept not million of people, but uh, 2,000, 5,000, 
5,000 5, among 10 million. Uh, it's, it's feasible, it's not impossible. There is the European money to manage uh, this absorption and this integration. So it's, uh, it is possible. And I add one important point that is important to say. Um, Europe is a very aging society. This is today one of the most, in my view, negative characteristics of our continent. Aging society with some countries like Germany, but also like Italy and Spain, with a very aging uh, demographics. So you need immigrants for these countries. You need immigrants, but of course you need immigrants integrated in the country. So speaking uh, the, the language and uh, living with the people and integrating. Uh, if not, Europe will lose in the next 30 years uh, 20 or 30 million uh, people and because of this aging society. Only France is a country with a very good uh, fertility rate and very good demographic. For the rest, Europe is a disaster. So this is why we have to look at the migration problem as a whole with all the nuances, uh, knowing that the integration is an asset for us. But we have to work on the integration. And the only way to integrate is to spread. The only way to integrate is to create a, a diffused integration process. And this is why we have to be very tough with countries refusing. Because you know, the, 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 the strength of, of the European Union is the fact that we are a union of minority. In Europe, nobody is majority. Nobody is absorbing the others. We are all minorities. The Italian, the Germans, the French, the Austrian, the Finnish, all minorities. So we know what does it mean tolerance, because we are all minorities. But if we are all minorities, and I think it is a great value for us in the world of today, a world full of nationalists, to be a European Union, a uh, union of minorities and champion of tolerance, I think is very important. But being a union of minorities, being champion of tolerance means that you have to apply the solidarity value. And solidarity means I give you, you give me. I give you and I receive. And uh, solidarity works if there is this reciprocity. If I take from the European Union just money for uh, structural funds, development, uh, agriculture funds, and I don't uh, give solidarity, for instance, absorbing my part of refugees in my society, uh, it doesn't work. This is why solidarity is important if we apply solidarity. This is why without solidarity it would be impossible to manage this very complicated issue. Yes, yeah, solidarity. But for those newcomers, both for the Poland and Hungary, they could claim that uh, we didn't make those mistakes in, in, in Iraq, in Syria, and in Afghanistan. We, we, we didn't do that, and uh, we, we don't need the immigrants now. So, so we, we don't want to receive those refugees. And uh, actually, actually, I was in Hungary in the last two years, and I, I, I saw how urban governments uh, imposed uh, well stricter and stricter restrictions on immigrants, and and, and the people, a lot of people there, seem to be satisfied with this. Yeah. And and I and I and I also didn't see uh, the, the how could how could the Euro European Union uh, to, to, to to make make it tougher on those countries so to 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 any effective measures so to persuade them to persuade the people there to to receive those uh, immigrants or, or, or to cope with the EU level solution. You know, there is no country in the world who want immigrants. Immigration is always. Uh, uh, the consequence of the immigration is always the, the raise of fear of people living in, a, in, a can, in the country receiving immigrants. So it's a, it's a normal attitude, it's a normal reaction. But the key point is that we are in Europe, we are Europeans. If you, Hungary, 
decide to accede, to enter the European Union, to be part of the European Union, one of the key values of the European Union is that human rights, you have to respect them. Refugees, refugees, I repeat, it's different than migrants for economic reasons. Refugees, refugees because they are uh, escaping uh, debt, they are escaping wars. In our constitutions and our European values, we have at the very core the respect and the protection of uh, human rights and of, of refugees. So, being part of the European Union means that the European Union is champion of the application of this human right. And you can't be part of the European Union without accepting this point. So the key point is that these people coming from uh, uh, Syria, coming from Iraq, coming from Afghanistan, if they are refugees, and if we give them the asylum, uh, we have to manage their lives in our continent. We can't accept that was my big mission uh, when I was in, uh, in, uh, in politics, to say we can't accept the Mediterranean become a dead sea, a sea of uh, coffins. It's unacceptable. Uh, we, we know that the Mediterranean is, is, a, is a sea of life. And uh, we have to work to avoid tragedies like the one we had in the past. And I repeat, the only way to solve the problem is to, to spread it, to diffuse the solution. And for the Hungarians, we ask them to take three, four, two thousand people. It's nothing in a country with 10 million uh, inhabitants. So, and there is, European money to manage this problem, so it's uh, it's absolutely feasible. But it is feasible if uh, we apply the solidarity rule. If not, uh, they made a mistake to uh, enter the European Union because these values are European values, and without the application of these European values, you can be European but out of the European Union. So what if they threaten to leave the EU? Uh, you know. Uh, you are not uh, obliged to stay. If you want, uh, it is because you are uh, you you share a set of values. Uh, I hope the Hungarians will, will stay, but the majority of the Hungarians are uh, is not uh, uh, behind uh, Orban. The referendum they had some months ago, some weeks ago, on migration failed. Orman failed on the referendum. It's the demonstration that people understand. People understand that uh, you have to understand that the world and life is a situation in which you are once a people receiving. Once you can be a people uh, asking asylum. And the Hungarians, 56. The Hungarians were full of them, full of Hungarians in Europe, and we accepted them in '56. We accepted them uh, as I am seeking. So it's very contradictory the approach of Orban. I repeat, Orban, not the Hungarian people. Orban. It's very contradictory because Hungarian is a country that received solidarity from the others 50 years ago in Europe. Yeah. Uh, let's take the British case as another example. Uh, well, we found actually a significant disparity in, in that uh, Brexit referendum uh, that most young people voted to remain while the older generation voted to leave. And uh, people living in the urban area, Londoners, they voted to, leave, to remain and the people living in rural areas voted to leave. So uh, it seems clear that uh, those people think that uh, uh, they know who are benefiting from the European Union and who are not. And, uh, do, do, do you think that those people voted to leave and understand uh, where lies their best interests? And uh, should they to be blamed for their choice? I think it's a very complicated situation, the one in which the referendum uh, put uh, UK. Uh, first of all, because of this cleavage that you uh, rightly uh, uh, raised on, on uh, generations. Because yes, youth 
is in favor of Remain and aged are in favor of uh, Brexit. The problem is that the aged, the problem from my point of view, of course, the aged part of the population voted. The young didn't vote. The, the turnout of uh, young generation was very low, very low. Uh, the turnout of uh, aged uh, people was very high. So I think this cleavage was the reason why Brexit won. Because the age the population, they voted, and the young didn't vote. Uh, so this cleavage is clear, like the one you mentioned, the fact that cities uh, to remain and countryside uh, to Brexit. But now I think the main problem is the fact that uh, the UK is a divided country. You can't take such a decision 52 to 48. You will have a lot of conse negative consequences. This is why I think the key point is that the referendum was the wrong uh, tool, was the wrong way to decide. You can have a referendum, but at the end of a process, after having had the parliament, uh, the discussions, the regions, and so on and so forth. Having just one shot, one kill, the referendum, as a consultative referendum. This is why uh, the judges decided uh, some days ago to say, now the parliament has to vote. I think they're right, because the referendum is a, was a consultative one. It was not binding, legally binding. Many people maybe voted. When, when you vote on a consultative referendum, you vote uh, in a very, in a more easy way. So, uh, is, is a, I, I think the problem will, will continue for years and years. Uh, it will be a problem for them, first of all, for them. They made an enormous mistake because they will lose centrality for London. The strength of London is because Many companies, many financial services from all over the world are based in London because London is the door to the richest market in the world, the European market. If they get out from uh, Europe, they get out from the European market, the European single market. So for many companies, it, it is not no more an interest to have the European headquarter in London. They move, they will move the European headquarter another city inside the single market. Uh, this is the first, this will be the first consequence then we, when they will leave. Uh, but the, 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 the key problem would be, of course, for them also a problem of unity of the country, Scotland, the big mess in Ireland, Ireland uh, after years and years of uh, uh, negotiating peace process uh, reached an agreement. Uh, they were without a border. Now they, they, they have to rebuild the border because the border would be between Europe and non-Europe. So it's a, it's a crazy situation. Uh, but of course it's a problem for all uh, European countries too. Because this negotiation will take a long time and will create instability. And from far away from Europe from abroad, from China, or from the States, or from Japan, or from uh, uh, Singapore, uh, people, investors, will uh, look at Europe saying, uh, for the next years, Europe will be unstable. Europe and the UK will be unstable, because they will negotiate this very complicated agreement. And it is not an agreement that you can negotiate a French solution in one week. It, it would be at least two years, many, maybe more. So for this period, I'm sure that we will pay a cost of, the cost of the instability. And the uh, investment from abroad, I, I'm sure, will decline to the UK and to Europe too, because of this instability. Uh, this is why it is very important for us, for the Europeans, to know very clearly that the British they have decided, they want to get out, okay, we will negotiate the divorce, but we, Europeans, we, uh, 
don't have to wait for the divorce to relaunch ourselves. We have to separate the two dossiers and to say there's the divorce dossier, okay, we manage with the British the divorce, it is one issue, but for the rest we have many issues where we have to, European Union, the 27, we have to decide clearly where to go and we have, we have to decide clearly our mission in the future on uh, Euro, on economic union, on uh, uh, migrants as we told before and on many other issues. Uh, so I, I pledge very much for the separation between these two issues. Brexit is an issue, we manage the divorce, okay, but the key point for us, the key issue for us, is how to relaunch the European Union 27. And maybe the European Union 27 could be better, because the British were there and they blocked in the past many, many uh, important decisions of the uh, other Europeans because they didn't want to have a more integrated Europe. But in the world of tomorrow, a, a, a regional integration at European level is very important to be at the same level of China or at the same level of the United States or India. If not, the European countries will be too small, separated from each other. Yeah, but in the whole, you still think they made a, uh, they made a mistake right, for the, the Brexit to become true. But, but let's suppose if it was up to the Parliament to decide in the first place, uh, it is very likely that uh, they, they would decide to uh, to remain. I think. Uh, but uh, uh, at, at the same time, at least half of the British would, would say that uh, well, our voices hadn't been heard for, for those people, maybe older generation, and, uh, who, who do the labor jobs and who are not intellectuals or who are not living in cities. They think that uh, they've been harmed by the globalization process. And they want to take their control back, and they want to take their jobs back. And uh, to some extent, maybe it is true that they, they are harmed by globalization, and uh, and so 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 their voices are also visible, and and uh, they need a way to 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 well to make their life better or to make their life as good as maybe twenty years ago. You know, the, the key point is that I, I don't want to say I want to substitute uh, their uh, sovereignty. They have to decide. If they decide to leave, we accept this decision. What we can't accept is a uh, decision, non-decision. What we can't accept is a mixed feeling situation without clarity. As the one we uh, had, we used to have in the last uh, four months, in which we didn't know the date, we didn't know what was the plan B, we didn't we didn't know anything. So what we can't accept is this unclarity and uncertainty. This is why I said and I repeat, the referendum is not the correct tool for this kind of decision. Uh, because the referendum is one day decision, but uh, what is necessary is to take a wise decision. You can say that wise decision is to leave, and I, I, I can accept it. But when I say wise decision, I say a ponderated decision, a decision in which you have not 51 to 49, but you have a large majority of the country sharing the decision, and after a long period of discussion on the way to leave. Because what does it mean, leave? It's, it's, a, it's a very complicated, because there are many nuances. Uh, leave means to be like Switzerland, to be like Norway, to be like uh, Iceland, to be like... Uh... So, I think the, the, the decision they make they made was affected by the procedure. So the procedure was very negative and this procedure will create a lot of problems to them and to us too. You mentioned correctly the point of the globalization. It has been one of the most interesting uh, discussions we had at Beijing University on, uh, in these very days of the Beijing Forum. 
globalization is perceived by emerging countries as a very positive uh, uh, trend because globalization means more opportunities, uh, eradicating poverty, beating famine, uh, stressing digital progress. Globalization means all of these big achievements. In the industrialized uh, societies, globalization means the risk to lose certainties. So, uh, today, in our societies, in our European societies, but in the States, it's exactly the same. Um, look at uh, Trump. Uh, Trump's slogan was the same of the Brexiters, take back control. But uh, Trump and the States, they don't have Brussels. So it was comprehensible for the Brexiters because they want to take back control from Brussels uh, and to keep control in, in London, but for, for, the, for the US it was different. So that means that the situation in our industrial society is a situation in which you have people uh, with feeling to lose uh, jobs, to, do, to lose uh, certainties, to lose uh, uh, the situation uh, they, they are uh, they were used uh, to live uh, to, 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 to be in and uh, um, the, the, the key point is to cleave it between losers and winners of the globalization we have in our societies uh, a large part of the society which is cosmopolitan speaking many languages used to travel but there's also a part of our people not cosmopolitan speaking just their own language and not used to travel. Um, the, the cleavage between cities and countryside in the vote for Brexit is exactly the demonstration of that. This is why on globalization in our Western societies we have to be uh, very cautious. We have to explain all the benefits of globalization for us but also for the rest of the world. If uh, in China, you are able to eradicate uh, 300, 400, 500 million people from poverty. is a great achievement, it's a world achievement, uh, thanks to globalization. But for our internal domestic social situation, we have to create policies able to deal with the social consequences of the globalization at domestic level. Losing jobs, uh, pension uh, reforms, schemes, creating some properties, uh, regional uh, decreasing, new cleavages. Uh, this is why it's a domestic issue for us, but it's an important one. If we don't do that, we risk to leave uh, be the part of the society in a marginal uh, world, and this part of the society risks to be uh, uh, easily attracted by the populist parties, nationalisms. Nationalism is always the way and the flag to uh, attract people with fear, and uh, nationalism is very negative, is, is the worst in my view. Because now for, for uh, the consequence of nationalism is the race of enemies. You have to build enemies if you are a nationalist. Uh, and uh, sometimes you build enemies, and sometimes you build enemies that uh, don't exist. And uh, the consequence of that is that you leave the society in a situation in which uh, everybody is against uh, each other. And uh, at the end of the day, you can have some consensus, but you lose a lot of good opportunities. So maybe at last, the problem is still, um, is, as what Bill Clinton once put it, that the problem is still about the economy. Well, if, if the European Union, the, in the EU level, it can boom its economy in the coming years, maybe the mood of nationalism in those countries would uh, deceive, or well, the, the solidarity would be is again, if the economy got better. I think economy is, is, is a crucial issue there because nationalism rises always when 
when the economy goes down and you have to find scapegoats. Or, uh, this is why we have this crisis now as consequences, as consequences for what I think of the financial crisis. The financial crisis at the end of the day created uh, unemployment in many countries. It's not by chance that the populist approach is raising in countries with very high uh, populism. So very high sorry, unemployment. So unemployment uh, brings um, uh, populism, uh, nationalism. Uh, it is not by chance that in the UK you had in London the pro remain very high. London is a city uh, without uh, unemployment. But in the rest of the country you have situation, very different situations. And uh, this is why I think on, on, on this topic the problem of uh, how to uh, boost our uh, economy, how to beat unemployment. First of all, how to beat youth unemployment. Because the big risk is to have a uh, lost generation. In Italy, for instance, we are experiencing this, this very bad situation in which youth leaves the country uh, looking for... Uh, New, uh, new jobs or new opportunities uh, in other European countries or, or in, in the States, in Australia. Uh, and, and it's, uh, it, at the end of the day, it's a very bad, bad, bad trend. So, um, since you mentioned Italy, let's talk about uh, what's happening in your country now. And we all know that uh, there will be a constitutional referendum in December. And uh, I think uh, this is might be uh, this might be a, a solution or a, or a measure that uh, the Italy as a country wants wants to take to 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 cope with uh, the, the, the those crises on the EU level and also what happen, what's happening in the Italy. Uh, so and and, and as, as far as I know, it it will be the biggest reform in the constitution since the end of monarchy after the let's say the World War. Uh, so um, if if it is really uh, but will be effective measure to uh, to improve Italy's administrative political structures. So why? Uh, uh, so so the first of, first I want to ask is uh, what is the now what is the current problems on the such on, on the current system of the constitution in Italy? The, the most important one. The Italian situation is uh, first of all uh, the big dif difficulties linked to the slowdown of the economy. And the slowdown of the economy and the big cleavage between youth and aged, uh, in which we are we experienced for uh, five years in a row a very high unemployment rate, youth unemployment rate. And when you have five years in a row this very bad figure, you have a, a very bad consequence in terms of lost generation. This is why the youth today is very anti-traditional uh, parties. Is uh, they have two options, or not, not they don't vote, or they vote for a populist uh, movement. And uh, it is, in my view, the consequence of these five years in a row of very high level of youth unemployment. On the other side, we have still a big cleavage, economic cleavage, between north and south of the country. We didn't manage and we didn't succeed in finding the good recipes to boost the economy uh, for the south. This is why Italian northern uh, economy is running very good. For the south, the problem is still there. And uh, if you have has to take into account the South uh, figures that are very negative. On the other side, the third point is about the European crisis. Italy paid a very high cost uh, to the uh, European financial crisis, the highest cost, because of the interest rates. Italy has one big problem. The big problem of the country is the debt. And uh, with such a debt, such a high debt, we need stable and low interest rates. 
the risk to have instability, tensions, and then to have again interest rates raising for us is a mortal risk because that means paying a lot of money to keep the way the debt uh, alive. That was the case in the period of the crisis, years 10, 11, 12. Italy paid an enormous cost. The cost was the raise of interest rates to keep alive the debt. And so we paid, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 billion euros more than uh, France and Germany. And that was enormous. So the reasons of the crisis of the country are, first of all, economic and financial reasons. Because of the past, the debt, the debt is the legacy of the past and the difficulties that I mentioned. Uh, we are having a referendum, December the 4th, on a constitutional change. The constitutional change, I think, uh, touches very two very important uh, subjects that, is, that are. One is the role of the Senate, so it's a downgrade of the Senate, and uh, upgrade of the uh, Chamber of Deputies role. And the second one is a reshape in the relationship between the center and the peripheries in how to take decisions on big infrastructures, energy, and field, and so on. There are two important fields, but we we have not to, and, uh, to over-evaluate the importance of these uh, two subjects. This is why I think in the country we are you know, we the Italians, we are always used to dramatize everything. We are the country of drama. Uh, so we are dramatizing too much the referendum. This is what I think. Uh, I, I hope the referendum uh, will pass, but it is not a drama if the referendum doesn't pass. It doesn't, uh, if the no wins. It's, it, it is not a drama because it's a... Uh, it is an important issue, but it is not life or death. Uh, this is why I don't understand this polarization, this dramatization of this issue that is creating uh, uh, around the world tensions, anxieties. We are in, here in Beijing, we are talking about the referendum in Italy. But the referendum in Italy is completely different from the referendum on Brexit. Because the referendum on Brexit was on a topic, being in or out of the European Union, that would have affected uh, all the European political life for years and years, and we are now experiencing what, what does it mean. The Italian referendum is, a, is absolutely a marginal uh, topic at the European level, so what I think is that we have to re- uh, shape all this discussion and to say clearly is not a drama uh, it is an important topic but uh, I think life goes on and uh, I hope the referendum will, will, will win the yes but we have to consider that the true topics of the countries of the country of Italy are other topics are the economy the social issues the cleavage north south and how to give hope to the new generations. These are the true hope. The role of the Senate, yes, is important, but frankly speaking, is very marginal in comparison with these other topics. Well, but still, Italy is, it is the third largest economy within mm -hmm. the European Union, and, and one of the well, very important countries in the G8 group, groups. So, political structure, is going to change it. The, the, the outcome would shake the economy, would shake the EU economy. Yes, but it would shake the economy because the government said uh, it would resign in case of no. Not because of the result, the concrete result of the referendum in a way or another. So the big mistake was uh, to, to, to keep, to take this kind of, uh, uh, well, say, enormous consequence to a, a result of a referendum. I think it was a mistake to link the survival or not, life or not, life or death of the government to the result of the referendum. The referendum is an important topic, but it's not, in my 
list of priorities, in my ranking of priorities is at maybe at the 10th or the 12th uh, position before you have uh, other 10 most more important issues like uh, jobs, like uh, youth unemployment, like cleavage north-south, like uh, these are the true, like the, the Italian debt, the financial situation, these are the most important subjects. Yes, the role of the Senate is important, but it is not among the first top priorities of the country. And I think the reform is also, is also including a change in the electoral law, which would make a, a, a less pro, a, pro, 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 probability of a, of our coalition government and make the government more stable and uh, can control control more authority. In truth, the electoral law is out of the referendum, so the referendum doesn't. Uh, uh, touch the electoral law. The, the electoral law uh, has been, uh, that the government approved and the parliament approved uh, the electoral law. The electoral law is there, but there is no direct link between the vote to the referendum because the referendum is only on the constitution change. And the electoral law is not in the constitution, it's out of the constitution. So the referendum technically doesn't touch the electoral law. So is a is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, let's maybe go back to the real problem you think well, is in Italy that the economy, the unemployment rate, and that what makes I think some people in Italy they think that uh, it is because of the eurozone, it's because of the euro, they can't make their own interest rate, they, they can't have their own fiscal policy or the monetary policy, and uh, they they will need these measures to 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 regain the jobs and to, to, to reboom the economy and, and uh, well, maybe there will be more, do you think there will be momentum or the mood uh, in Italy that uh, some people will call for leaving the Eurozone? No, I don't think so. Uh, Italy is a country in which if you ask the people with a poll, are you happy with the European Union, the majority of the people answers no, I'm not happy. But if you have a second question and you ask, uh, do you want to leave the euro and to come back to the lira, the majority of the people says, please don't. Because the, we, we remember uh, that the lira was a very weak currency. And in the world of today, we can't uh, live with a weak currency having such a big debt. This is the key point. The, the, the euro was a big defense for us in the troubled uh, international situation with a country with, with the debt. Fortunately, uh, we have our shoulders. It's a, it's a, it's a huge problem for us. So um, it is not just for Italy. The fact that uh, we consider the euro as a big defense uh, is the same for France or for Spain, countries with people angry with Europe, but without any idea to leave the euro. Uh, so the key point is today how to help the European Union and European euro area countries to find the, the right uh, policies to boost investment, to boost employment, and to beat unemployment and lack of growth. We need investments in Europe. The Juncker plan, uh, this 350 billion euros plan, is a good step, it's a first step, but we need more investment. We need to attract uh, FDI. This is why Brexit is so negative, because Brexit, with all the uncertainties that Brexit will bring, is a way to keep away the, 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 the FDI. I, I think we need. Uh, the, the, the true mission and the true priorities at European level are, are linked to this topic. How to boost investment at European level, how to complete the economic and monetary policy, how to, how to give the possibility to our European Union to have the tools to rescue a country in difficulty, to help a country in difficulty and not to ask the IMF to come to rescue a country as the uh, IMF did with Greece uh, three times. Uh, these are, and, and this is the way also to, to say to the markets, 
we are able to uh, to uh, to make it on our own. Yeah. Well, since you mentioned investment, I would like to ask the last question on this topic. Uh, how do you feel the China's in increasing the increasing investment in Europe? And, and in Italy, some business ventures are well, invested uh, some of the most important football teams in Italy. And uh, uh, I, I know that uh, the Germany, uh, the, in some, some cases in Germany, they have concerns over the investment, the Chinese investment, Chinese money on their country to buy in the large companies they, 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 they want to own. And so maybe there's mixed feelings in Europe to work on the, the large investment outside Europe, especially in China. Maybe. Uh, as usual, there's always this uh, contradictory approach. We want foreign investment, but uh, when foreign investment uh, comes, we are not happy because we prefer the passport, our passport. And it is a contradiction. Uh, we need foreign direct investment, and uh, if, they, if they are Chinese, welcome. So the key point is to live in a in a relationship based on reciprocity. This is the only way to say welcome to the Chinese investment in Europe, but of, we, we uh, pretend that our European investment in China, they have to be welcome at the same way. Uh, giving the possibility to own companies or to buy companies, to run in uh, the economic uh, financial Chinese market uh, in the same way in which we allow the Chinese uh, capitals to do the same in Europe. This is the, the perfect way and we are not uh, in this reciprocity. The reciprocity. Uh, we, we have to work, we have to improve, but I think it's, uh, it's the correct way. As you know, we gave an important uh, demonstration of goodwill investing in the AIIB, the Asian uh, Investment Infrastructure Bank. Uh, even without the positive uh, uh, advice of, of the United States, they were against. We decided to do it as Europeans because we think that uh, we need this investment, we need to share big projects, big investment projects. One Belt, One Road is a great project. We want to be on board on this project. We have our companies able to do that, and we want to share uh, this investment because it's the way to, uh, to grow together. And uh, I think it's the only way for us to uh, get recovery and to, uh, to beat unemployment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.